on the topic National Cohesion for Growth and Progress, the Nigerian Dilemma. Ladies and gentlemen, a rousing applause. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I know that uh, the topic itself sounds like a topic for a pretty long lecture. Um, let me, again, as we say, stand on existing protocols. As at last night, at actually at about 11 o'clock, I was still on my computer. And I decided to call Eric to find out, um, again, what was happening. And then it was only then I, I saw the list of the names of the respondents, more or less, to my paper. And I had actually, quite mistakenly, spent a bit of my time writing a paper, which I had to leave in my computer. Because after the death of uh, the clerk, I wanted to do a comparative analysis of uh, the clerk uh, and Gorbachev. Um, as leaders that took an incredible suicidal risk, but just for the transformation of their country. But I think at the end, uh, after I spoke to Eric at about 11, and I looked at what needed to be said, and the people, I thought it may not be fair uh, to them because I'll probably be putting them in a corner. So this morning, I just make it, I made a few notes that I will be speaking to. Um, in January this year, let me, this is on a commercial note now, there's a book I have which is going to be published, and the title of the book is Broken Truths, Nigeria's Elusive Quest for National Cohesion. Um, it's a collection of, I just selected 10 um, of the almost 20 or so convocation lectures I've delivered across Nigeria. I haven't received close to 30 invitations from different universities. Uh, and I'm quite humbled by the fact that people think one has something to say. Um, last week I was uh, on a Zoom meeting with a group of young Nigerians in different parts of the world. The conversation was actually supposed to last um, about an hour, but we ended up dragging for two hours, and after even beyond two hours, I was the one who said, no, it's, let's stop like that. What was fascinating for me about the conversation was that these young people felt so challenged by what they thought I had to say, um, and while I considered to them the right to feel like leaving Nigeria, and while I considered that we are all tired and frustrated, because the nature of my work is to market hope. Uh, people still kept asking me, these young people were asking me, Bishop, we have almost concluded plans of leaving Nigeria, but you are making it difficult for us. We're going to have the conversation again, because I think that perhaps one of the things that has been missing in the conversation about Nigeria, which speaks to the nature of the politics that we play, is that our political affiliations and feelings are always so divisive that we end up living in little cubicles. And people just think that somehow you have a right to disagree with us. Um, not really, but the only right we concede you is the right to agree with us. And I'm mightily proud, let me put it that way, that people like some of the people, I will not call names. A lot of the people who vilified me, abused me, and wrote all kinds of things for which I made no reply and now coming full cycle, and for the better part of two or three or so years, I meet Nigeria and they say, Bishop, what did you see that the rest of us didn't see? I didn't see anything. But I just had a feeling that there are certain parameters that good governance has to meet. And for me, the conversation has not been about APC, it's not been about President Buhari, although tangentially, given where we are, and that what Dr. Kami, uh, uh, what is his name? Kaya Defiami has said himself, despite being a leading member of the party, it's impossible for me to improve on that. But I speak to the issues about what really are the building blocks for national cohesion. How do you achieve national cohesion? I don't know, but I think that the critical pillar has to be the quality of the constitution that a country has. A constitution doesn't necessarily solve all the problems but it offers us a moral pillar around which to hang debates and expectations. And, you know, after the French, I mean, after the American Revolution, um, the interesting question Americans were asking themselves, well, we had fought. We have now, we now need to figure out what to do. And the issue was, 
issues of taxation, the unresolved issues of even ideological dispositions and how people were feeling about the new country. And then there were issues of interstate trade. How do we regulate trade among ourselves? And then, of course, the, the other larger issues about external aggression. How do we keep our country protected? Therefore, in 1787, as most of you already know, um, the Americans decided that they're going to have what they call a constitutional convention. And this convention was to help them reconcile all these disparate, conflicting, uh, counterperitating perceptions about what the future of the country was going to look like. Because remember that even in 1776, when the, the, the Declaration of Independence was written, barely 10% of Americans were educated. And Nigerians must always, because Nigerians are angrier now than they have always been. But we mistakenly get nostalgic about the past and we think, oh, the past was better. It really is not that the past was better. Truly, there were less, we were less, we had less capacity to interrogate the systems. We were less educated. Now that we are better educated and we are traveling more and we are seeing more, and Nigerians are, Nigerians are rightly becoming impatient. So the critical questions for me is that the conversations we are having now are not new. The real challenge is the leadership with the right disposition. Because after all, an orchestra, all, all people playing in an orchestra play different, you know, different tunes. It is a business of the conductor to harmonize all these tunes to give good music. So really critical to our conversation is the quality of leadership but also the depth of understanding of those who are our leaders. And so the question then was, what are we to do? A man called James Madison, who will later become the fourth president of the United States of America, was intensely interested in this debate. And his best friend, interestingly, Thomas Jefferson, was his best friend. But Thomas Jefferson was living in France. So he wrote a letter to Thomas Jefferson to say, look, we're going to be debating the future of our country and writing a constitution. I need to understand the difference between Republican constitutions and federal constitutions. So can you please help me get some reading material related even laws and contracts and agreements within the Roman and Greek city-states. Get me whatever you can get. And his friend Thomas Jefferson went round many bookshops in Paris over a period of time and was able to send him, as they say, a total of 190, 197 books just to read and prepare for this debate on the Constitution. Now, it is also very interesting because up till today, Americans agree that James Madison is called the father of the American Constitution. And people call him the greatest genius in constitutional design. And then, of course, he's often referred to as the philosopher among statesmen and the statesman among philosophers. What we're saying, therefore, because if you contrast it with our situation in Nigeria, from 1914 right up till today, because after over 60 years, we are still in no agreement about the nature of our constitution. The debates have become more acrimonious, more frustrating. And what has always been very interesting about the debates of the Nigerian constitution has always been the perception the quality and the caliber of people that have always been sent to the Constituent Assembly. I was lucky that in 2005, I was appointed Secretary of the Political Reform Conference. I know what I saw. I know the caliber of people I saw. And I don't mean disrespect. But you are a lot of people who had just absolutely no idea of why they came, beyond the fact that governors say we should come. Now, in 1977, the 1977, in debating the 1977 uh, uh, constitution for, I mean, in 1977, one, one thing was very interesting that happened. That is, during the Sharia debate, most Southerners said that they were hearing about the word Sharia for the very first time. And I remember the most dramatic person was Sambakwe. Sambakwe said, this thing they are calling Sharia, what is it about? And at the end, of the debate in 1978. It was very interesting that subsequent discussions about the Nigerian constitution, the hottest part of the debate was always the issue of the status of Sharia law. In fact, a member who, 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 
uh, participated. I don't want to call his name. But he said to me, he was somebody from the north, but a Christian from the north. And he said, you know, the Sharia debate was really, really wonderful for us. Because those who were Christians went around saying, we defeated Sharia. And if you remember, almost, literally all the Muslim delegates walked out. And what was interesting was this gentleman, when I went to interview him for my PhD, when I was writing my PhD, he said to me, he said, look, what was beautiful about the Sharia was that those of us who defeated the Sharia, we went back and told our people, if you don't vote for us, Sharia will come. And then the Muslims who thought they lost Sharia went back to their people and they said, if you don't vote for us, we will not get back Sharia. It sounds trivial, but what is very interesting is that by 1989, the National Assembly discussion led by, chaired by, by, by I mean, debate chaired by Justice Aniagolu had very terrifying conclusions because Justice Aniagolu says in his book that at the time they were debating the, the, the clause, the Sharia clause, on the eve, they, first of all, they had to suspend the debate. On the eve, according to Justice Aniagolu, his book is there, you can read it. He says, machets and pangas and knives had vanished from the market between Suleja and what was Abuja. Because members of the Constituent Assembly had gathered and on the day they were going to take the, thing, the decision, final decision about whether or not to extend what the Muslims were asking for in terms of the scope of Sharia law. That was the level of preparedness. In the 1978 debate, when there was tension, when the Muslims walked out, a 25-man committee was set up to review the issues. And what was very interesting, because I went back and checked the records, out of those 25 persons, the only person who didn't go into politics was Simeon Adebo. He was the chairman. The other 24 people who were part of that committee that quote-unquote resolved the Sharia crisis, 24 of them, or 23 of them, ended up in MPN. One of them who was in, in, in PDP, uh, no, in, uh, in MPP, that is uh, uh, Paul Unongo, if you remember in 1983, after Chagari offered him a job, he also was literally on the verge of joining the MPN. What am I saying? I'm just saying that something as fundamental as a constitution, the debate and the issues that ought to form the kernel of our governance, has never been subjected to the intellectual rigor that is required. The result is that we've never debated this, our constitution based on the peculiarities, the cultural expectations, the hopes, the anxieties, and the fears of ordinary Nigerians. If you look at the South African constitution, the great thing that, that South Africans had, which we didn't have, was that Mandela walked out of prison in 1990, I think, is it uh, February 11th? Mandela walked out of prison. Now, it took until 1994 before Mandela became president. But even within those three and a half years of debate, the South Africans had an opportunity to debate all the, the thorns, the brambles, the issues, the, the unpalatable issues. They had an opportunity to debate those issues not around cameras, not as a political strategy. So by the time Mandela was sworn in and the South African parliament assembled, it was just to append signatures. The point I'm making, therefore, is that it is tragic because we must correlate the fact that this endless debate about Sharia, I mean about not only Sharia law, but also about the Constitution and our seeming immobility. Because if you now look at what happened in 1999 with our return to democracy, and what happened in Zamfara, and spilled over to the 11 or 12 northern states, when state governors were literally with gone in their heads, compelled, to adopt Sharia, to proclaim Sharia, suddenly the areas of the greatest and the worst human rights violations, tensions, murders, assassinations, and death are coterminous with those areas. What am I saying? That we must be careful with how much raw meat we feed our people with. Because the point is that we are still unable to come up with articles of engagement. Of course, the other thing is, where do we, where, in designing a constitution, where do you derive inspiration from? You, des, you derive inspiration from people's culture. It was, and it was important, but it has never been the case that non-Muslims sufficiently understood what Muslims were talking when they were talking about Sharia law. 
is never the case that Muslims sufficiently have created an opportunity for them to understand the anxieties of Christians. And in my view, a lot of this is feeding the violence that persists in our country today. That is why Nigerians keep thinking there must be something about religion and there is something about the inevitability of conflict between Christians and Muslims. The reality is that it is not so. But if you ask, there are other systems of government. We have decided to adopt democracy. But we could have adopted anarchy as a system of government. And it's legitimately a system of government. There's a system of government that, that is called anarchy. If you adopt anarchism as a system of government, what it means is that it's not the chaos that you imagine. Anarchy as a system of government simply says we don't have a leader. All right? And it has been tried in the world. We can try plutocracy. Plutocracy simply says only those who are rich can participate in government. Or we can try aristocracy. More or less, basically the same thing. And feudalism, which is only after you do a blood test and it is said that your blood is blue. That is, you belong to royalty. Those are the only people that can contest and seek office. Or we can decide on a theocracy. Theocracy simply means that only those who are religiously, either Christian, Muslim, whatever, that governance is, is a government by religious people. Or we can try oligarchy or communism. The oligarchs are just a bunch of few people who govern on behalf of others. Or colonialism. The British came. It was a system of government. Or totalitarianism. But we've opted for democracy. And we repeat the tired words of Churchill, who said that democracy is the worst form of government except for others. But we have agreed in Nigeria that we need an aggregate of principles and that given the nature of our country, democracy is what best approximates the opportunity for people to develop freely, exercise their freedom, live peacefully, manage diversity. Tragically, the basket of what we have called democracy is a combination of all the things I've listed. So, I, I then asked the question, why has national cohesion elu eluded us? Uh, Condoleezza Rice, in her book, you know, she wrote a very beautiful book on democracy, in which she said, every democracy is flawed at its inception. And indeed, no democracy ever becomes perfect. The question is not one of perfection, but how an imperfect system can survive, move forward, and grow. So it is not that we are having conflict. It is that how do we get men and women to be able to deal with the issues of this conflict? And if you look at, and this is why I, find, I, I literally cried at the death of, 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 of the clerk. He's not been given the credit that is his due. Because in the final analysis, this country will not be fixed until Muslims understand the grievances of Christians. Until Christians understand the grievances of Muslims. Until at an ethnic level, everybody understands the grievances of every ethnic group. Until we get to a point in which ordinary poor people understand that wealth is not, is not, is not something you know, to, be, to be envious about. And rich people understand that poverty is not an inheritance. And that we can all talk among ourselves and find the best way forward. Because if you look at a racetrack, 5, 10 or 20 people are in a racetrack. All of them are not well positioned. They are positioned differently. But the hope is that all of them will, will have a fair chance and nobody has an undue advantage. So the issue about our future is that national cohesion is largely a function of myth. People create mythologies. And these myths are a national flag, an anthem, music, a culture, song, literature, who our heroes are, what monuments we have, what archives we have, and what kind of myth we create among ourselves. Today, if you ask about, we say, oh, the labels of our heroes passed. Do Nigerians really have heroes? The answer is no. Because if you mention the name of Namdi Azikiwe, are you going to excite somebody in Jigawa? Are you exciting somebody in Kebi or in Sokoto? If you, if you go to Onicha, to Uyo, to Oweri, or to Port Harcourt, and you mention the name of Sadona, will you generate any excitement for anybody? Or if you take the name of Awolowo, and you go to, uh, to Ijo land or whatever, and in Bayelsa, will people get excited? Are we at a point in which we can say, like Churchill is to the British people, or Abraham Lincoln is, or Charles de Gaulle, and so on and so forth? Unfortunately, it is there, a nation has to have institutions that inspire national aspirations and confidence. Take a simple example of the universities in Nigeria today. All the federal universities, they've all become tribal clubs. Because you cannot say that Professor Mohamed Jega, for example, 
shows up in the University of Calabar and wants to be interviewed for vice chancellor. Are you crazy? Or that Professor Thomas Mwachuku has appeared in Sokoto and wants to be vice chancellor of Osman Danfodo University. You must be mad. Suddenly, these federal universities that were meant to be more or less the platform for our cohesion have been reduced into tribal enclaves. And what is very interesting is that you go to all the federal universities in Nigeria, you, go, you just listen. It is easy for Yorubas to sit down here and tell the rest of Nigeria about what they want, or, or for the Igbos, or for the Fulanis, or the Hausas. But you go back home and you discover it's not everybody even who is a Fulani man that can be vice chancellor in this, that, or the other place. It's not every Yoruba man that can be vice chancellor in Ibadan. It's not every Yoruba man that can be vice chancellor in Ife. It's not every Igbo man that can be vice chancellor in Nusuka. I no be so. We all know. So we have systematically reduced ourselves to a level in which national cohesion remains at best an illusion. So finally, let me try and round up by simply saying there is something to be said about the essence of democracy and governance. That you need to create an environment in which citizens, ordinary citizens, that everybody will rise according to the, their God-given talent and destiny. You remember the story of Mohammed Bozizi, you know, the young man who, who's, uh, uh, who committed uh, you know, self-immolation uh, in, uh, in, in, in Tunisia on the 17th of December, uh, 2010, and whose action sparked off the Arab Spring. Now, what was his issue? And he speaks to the issue of dignity and how people perceive you. Now, the poor man, he came from a very poor background. And he was just doing his business of wheeling his goods and selling them on the street. On this particular day, the guy has taken a loan. He's got a wife, he's got a family. His father died you know, a miserable death and left them with, po with poverty. The father left them a small plot of land. That land had even been taken away by the state for a loan he took and couldn't pay. Now the poor man is pulling his truck. A policewoman stops him. And he had become famous, you know, with the police. Because among other things, the narratives are saying that he was not good at bribing the police. They ask him, what is this? And before the poor man could say anything, the police officer, a woman, slaps him. Now, I mean, Donu Kubara, my friend, is sitting beside me here. If she slaps me, she's a big woman. So... I can say, well, I couldn't revenge because you But to be slapped by a woman, how do you go and tell your wife that you were slapped by a woman? So I'm, Mohammed Bouzouzi is standing there. He's slapped by this woman. He doesn't, revenge, he doesn't retaliate. Then they confiscate his cart. And he goes to see the governor. He says, come, on, come and see. The governor refuses to see him. So what, he says, what am I left with? He decides to go and buy petrol, throws it on, on himself, puts himself on fire. What, what, am, what, what am I living for? So National cohesion is an ideal, but let us understand, because when you live in a society in which citizens cannot understand why they are poor, then you are in trouble. Because if people do not know as it is in Nigeria today, if you ask a young man, like, right, I hear, I get all these young men coming to me day in and day out. Young boys and young girls. They've graduated. They've got a 2-1. They've got good results. Where are they going to get? You ask, they say they are recruiting people in the army. Can I apply? I say, I apply. They say they are recruiting people in uh, road safety. They are recruiting people in, uh, you heard the story here in FCDA. They say, <laughs> Internal Revenue Service, 38,000 applications were received. 38,000. From what I saw on television, the members of the House of Representatives went to do oversight. And they had already decided to hire people without even opening the 38,000 applications. So when you live in this kind of country, I don't see how, because patriotism is not a commodity of exchange. You know, people who are ministers today, I see them all the time because I've been around for more than 40, I'm going to be 45 years a priest this year. So I've been around for quite some time. But I see all these ministers who were abusing me 10 years ago or 15 years ago. They say, you are causing trouble for our bishop. I mean, you are causing trouble for our country. You don't like our party. Then they are removed as minister. And then they start to say, ah, Bishop, hey, this, this government, the thing you were saying, it really was true. Oh. I've seen, I'm familiar with those cycles. But our nation must come together. I bet like, and I think Dr. Fayemi made the point eloquently, I can't improve on it, that you cannot expect people to love your country if you don't love and respect them. So I want to thank uh, um, 
Eric for this wonderful idea. Like he said, you shall know the truth. Dr. Mufayemi added, and the truth shall set you free. But remember, the truth is not as simple as we want to make it look. When Jesus applied, appeared before Pilate, and he still talked about the truth, Pilate said, truth, what is that? And Justice Oputa used to, you know, I said to people, they say, ah, I'm telling you, what I'm telling you is the truth. Or the newspaper is famous for writing the truth. No, there is no truth. It's, not, it's always elusive. Because even the lawyers will tell you, ah, if you want to know the truth, hear both, or the judge, hear both sides. But you can hear both sides and still not get the truth. Because there is, there is, this, there is your side, there is my side, and there is the truth. Very often the truth is hidden in the crack somewhere. Uh, I end up, there is, uh, let me, before I go, there's this poor man, he had always been a victim, and uh, my, my friend, uh, you must hear this. So the man decided, he said, look, these lawyers, I am tired. Every time he goes, they have taken my farm, I go to court. We try and try, they find I'm not able to win my case. So he decided to go to it, because he said he will listen, the judge will say, we tell him one thing, and then, so one day he decided to go to a judge, a, a, a chambers. He said, look, uh, I'm looking for, I want, is there a lawyer here who has only one hand? And the man said, what do you mean? He said, I want a lawyer with only one hand. He said, no, we don't have a, a disabled lawyer here. So he kept going around. When he got to the third law firm, he said, do you have a lawyer here with one hand? He said, no, we don't have a lawyer with one hand. Why? He said, look, I want a lawyer with one hand because every time I go to court, they would talk, talk, talk. Then they would say, on the one hand and on the other. <laughs> so I want a lawyer. When I tell my story, it will be that is the end of it. Thank you very much, Eric, and congratulations. Please, there is a seat there for you. Vintage Bishop Matthew Hassan Kuka.